Well, first I'm going to answer the first question, what is Bt? And Bt stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria that is common in all the soils around the world. And in the past 70 years, it has been discovered that it's very, very specific for only certain types of insects. So it kills some insects and not others. So that's what Bt is all about. And Bt resistance is like when the pests that you are trying to control with Bt insecticides are becoming immune to it. Kind of analogous when you go to a hospital and you hear that now the antibiotics are not working very well because microbes have become immune. It's the same situation with insects. Uh, after repeating the same insecticide over and over and over, there's a chance that they become immune to, to the, this type of insecticide. There are two answers to why we can expect to see resistant uh, evolution on agricultural fields in, in this country. Number one, the U.S. was the first country that adopted these uh, crops. So there have been already 17 years of insects being exposed to these crops. And insects are so numerous that if you think that each species has two to five generations each year, and mutations in insects occur naturally, there's a chance that this high number of insects, one of them, or many of them, will, just by chance alone, have a mutation that will allow them to become resistant to Bt. So it's just a matter of, of time when this might happen, and it's just a matter also of possibilities hundreds of thousands, if not millions or even trillions of insects, they can mutate naturally and one of those mutations can confer them resistant to Bt insecticide. Bt resistant evolution is really not a problem right now, surprisingly, but we need to be very careful with that. Uh, I need to give a little bit of background into this answer. Before we got for example, Bt cotton or Bt corn 17 years ago, we used to spray a lot the insecticide fields. For example, on cotton, it was kind of common to spray up to 15 times just to control the tobacco bulbworm. Now Bt cotton has become so effective against this insect that now we no longer need to spray insecticides to control this insect, right? It used to be problem number one in agricultural fields. So one of the things that we need to, to be very uh, vigilant is to see if this insect is not evolving uh, resistant to Bt because we really don't want to go back and continue spraying large amounts of insecticide on either cotton or corn. But can a plan B for to uh, battle resistance Number one is to stop the use of these uh, GE crops in a certain area, only where resistance has been discovered. Mm -hmm. Number two, we still have insecticides that we use them properly. They can overcome the situation of Bt resistance. This has happened already in other countries, like for example in Mexico. Either the use of Bt cotton or insecticides have and battle the resistance of the tobacco bulbworm precisely. So, um, as you say, we have been very lucky, and it's not only luck, because uh, industry, the federal government, and researchers have put Plan A that has been several measures to preserve the susceptibility of Bt. We are talking about really high, uh, very effective plants, and also planting of refuges. And also, as I explained you, we have plan B in case that we ever see resistant evolution. Working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, specifically for the Animal uh, and Plant uh, Health Inspection Service, means that this is just a tiny part of the agricultural department that is looking or trying to prevent the introduction of pests. We are talking about weeds or microbes or even animals that can damage American agriculture. So that's the main scope of this part of the Department of Agriculture. 
what I do specifically in that department is to look at the plans for testing of these new genetically engineered crops. So since there are novel modifications, something that we don't know much about it, we, I mean, I'm talking about a diverse group of scientists that I work with, we put some kind of measures and barriers for these crops to be tested safely. And ultimately, we also look into the whole package and the history of, of development of this crop and the uh, evidence that this is not going to be a problematic crop once that is put into commercialization. I got interested in this field probably 20 years ago when it was just before these crops got commercialized, but they began uh, the testing phase. And I remember I was working on a field and I was comparing the use of insecticides with these new crops. And it really kind of got my attention that these crops, they are so well protected by their own production of insecticides that I really don't have to go out and scout for insect densities. I didn't have to look into which insecticide I was, uh, I was going to use, uh, utilize. I didn't have to load my tractor, clean the tractor, go over the field, and then come back later on to see if it really worked. The plants are doing that all by themselves. So right away, I thought that this was kind of the, the future of uh, pest control in agriculture. So since then, I've been getting involved into testing and reviewing information and discussing with, with colleagues. And I don't know if what really got me there specifically, but it has been, you know, almost 20 years of involvement and meeting a lot of people and discussing ideas, helping, hard work, and also being very interested in the topic. I'm all the time very excited about it and I try to learn as much as possible from all my, my colleagues and friends. There is a big demand for scientists internally, I mean internally in the U.S. and also abroad. It can be divided internally, like even the federal government, we hear that there are less and less opportunities and not, right now nobody is hiring. Actually, in the biotechnology sector, we still have several vacancies and this is one of the few offices that is growing in the federal government. Plus, the agricultural um, biotechnology firms are growing exponentially. They are hiring people not only in the U.S. but hiring them here and sending them abroad because this is growing very, very fast. So at the moment, there are kind of two fields where uh, future students, future scientists can devote their energies and talents. One is definitely genetics, because this is this involves a lot of genetics. And the other can be the old-fashioned field work, because whatever you do in the, in the lab is very interesting and extremely important, but eventually these crops, these new ideas, they need to be tested in the field. And that is also an opportunity for people like me who like to be outside in the fields. There's going to be quite a bit of uh, opportunities in the future.